I want to jump into the message, and uh, at the end, we will have a time of doing Kingdom Builders offering, but let me jump into it for right now and ask you a question, or, or make, make a statement, then ask a question. Some people like to live life at the edge. Do you know someone who likes to live at the edge in life? Do you, do you know, so I see some, so online, do you know someone who likes to live at the edge? Maybe you're the one who likes to live on the edge, or live at the edge. Are you be? Be honest, you're like I like living at the edge there, Pastor David. I, I kind of, uh, John's one of those, uh, just say, hey, that's me. I like to live on the edge or I know someone. I mean, going as fast as they can, working as much as they can, testing the limits of all kinds of areas of their lives. But when it comes to God's promises and getting through those wilderness seasons that we're in, we have to deal with what is at the edge so we can enter into God's promises. And here's what I want you to realize what's at the edge. At the edge of God's promises is temptations, compromises. So this is how we kind of start. I want you to think this right now. At the edge of God's promises is temptations, compromises. See, at the edge of God's promises becoming real in your life, temptation wants to come in and rip it away from you. It wants to take it away from you. The last thing the enemy ever wants you to do is walk into God's promises. As the last thing he ever wants for you is to walk into God's promises. And because he doesn't want you to walk through God's promises, he will do everything all the way up to the edge of God's promises to compromise you with temptation. Temptation will come your way because temptation's compromises will always make you settle for something less than God's best. So we realize that. So today we have a chance, a chance to step into God's promises for us as a church. Today we have a chance to step into God's promises as kingdom builders. That's what we, so that's what today is about. Today is not a sermon about kingdom builders, but it will connect in a certain way because we know that this is God's promises for us. It's to help Jesus, help resource Jesus, this building of his kingdom. And that's what kingdom builders is about. It is not about the name on our door, the name on our building, but the name above all names. It is about simply stepping up and saying, Jesus, we want to help build your kingdom. And so we do that globally, we do that locally, and we do that with future generations. I got some news for you. I won't show it on a slide because I forgot to, to, to get it before uh, Bailey left for Michigan to be with uh, her best friend who goes to college up in Michigan. And so she's my, she's my, uh, my slide person. And, and so I forgot to, to, to get this to her, but I got it. And so I have a total for you that I want to give to you of how much we've given uh, to Kingdom Builders so far in 2021. Now to let you know, our goal was $105,000. So that was our goal, that we would give $105,000 through 10% uh, of our tithe and through our, our uh, yearly, monthly, weekly giving to Kingdom Builders, as well as in the miracle offering. And so our total, are you ready? Online, are you ready? So that they don't know yet either. Sometimes they get it, get it ahead of time, but I didn't give it to them ahead of time. Are you ready? Because yes. I don't think you're ready. You didn't seem very ready. You know, I was like kind of... Kind of like building it up, and it's like, okay, all right. Are you ready? Yes. All right, okay. $111,000. Come on. Isn't that awesome? Put that in perspective is in the first 16 months, because we had started Kingdom Builders in 2019, the, first, the first, last four months of 2019. The first 16 months, we gave 112000 and so to know that in, what well, this is November, so in less than 11 months, we have almost matched what we did in 16 months. That's incredible. Hey, let's just throw a little pandemic in there in the middle and look at what God has done. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, so, so that's exciting. And one of the things that, that how it got to that number is because you guys went like lights out on our Mother's Day, Father's Day giving. Our Mother's Day, Father's Day giving just blew us out of the water in, in the particular projects that was hitting, whether it was Rescue Sunday, which was rescuing uh, girls from sex trafficking, or uh, it was feeding uh, kids for, for 12 months. Those two, that, feeding kids during Father's Day, rescuing uh, kids, or, or it's mostly girls, but kids from sex trafficking uh, you know, on Mother's Day. And in those two alone, I don't have the number, but those two alone, we, we blew it out of the water. And so that's why we're at $111,000. We still have projects to fully fund. Because you'd be like, oh, good, we're done, right? Well, why are we doing the miracle offering? Because there's still projects that need to be fully funded. One of those projects is Seed Company. And Seed Company is an organization that helps write the Bible in a language it hasn't been written yet. And so we have a project there that we want to fully fund. 
We have a project with In a Pinch, which is right here in Grant County, that they help with foster care placement, uh, uh, emergency foster care placement, where they get clothing and they get uh, all kinds of items for those kids, for those homes, so when that kid comes into that house, they actually have stuff they can wear because emergency placement happens right away. And so In a Pinch, we want to make sure we meet that project and see that happening. What's beautiful is you guys are already fully funded. Things like, we, 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 uh, we, we monthly give to missionary, 35 missionaries, actually 35 plus missionaries and organizations around the world and around the United States. That's all fully funded. Our New Life Outreach is fully funded. Our New Life Cares, which, is, which loves on people in all different kinds of ways, including utility assistance, uh, is fully funded. So uh, all our, our ministry to, we call it College Connection, fully funded. So much fully funded. Our, our residencies, our uh, internships and practicum, all that fully funded. So, so much fully funded here at New Life. But with Seed Company, In a Pinch, there's a few others. Our Boys and Girls Club uh, project needs to be fully funded. There, there, so there's just some of these still need to be fully funded. Today's an important day to see that happen. Somebody's car. I don't know whose. So if you park on that side, it might be yours. Um, I don't even know what to do right now. So uh, I do know what to do, but it like, you know, kind of kind of gets you a little distracted at the moment. Everyone just, everyone get your keys out and just point that way, right? So someone did, all right, come on, good job. Whoever, I don't know who, good job, everyone. So, <laughs> uh, but I'm just so excited about what we've done already, and I'm excited what's going to happen in 2022. But man, can, let, let's do it, right? Right? Come on, let's fully fund these projects. And, and if we fully fund the projects, we're going to be like 120 something thousand dollars. And that's just a beautiful, beautiful the new life. I'm so proud of you. So proud of you. In the midst of all that we've gone through, everything that we've been dealing with, to see you guys step up. And even so, even rescuing more girls from sex trafficking or kids from sex trafficking is still possible because we've not funded the, the, the we, we put 9,000 into the 105,000. We just sent everything that came to Rescue Sunday. So just so you know, we've rescued a total in the last three years, 44 girls or kids from sex trafficking. And if we fully, come on. I would love to get to 50 by the end of the year, and that's if we fully fund that project. And so there's so many great things, feeding uh, kids around the world, helping with disaster relief. You funded so much of this. This is all about God's promises, and I don't want to settle for less than God's best. And we get a chance today to do something that we will receive the offering at the end of this message. But I want us first to see what compromises uh, temptation brought to the Israelites uh, at the edge of God's promises because I think it'll help us with our own temptations that come at the edge of our uh, promises that God has for us as we go into the, or we go, come out of a wilderness season. God wanted his promises to become real for Moses and the people after 40 years. But temptation was right on the edge. And so I find this part of the wilderness journey is, it's interesting. You got to remember God told Moses to leave the Moabites. Remember, that's the descendants of Abraham's nephew Lot, if you remember that. Told him to leave them alone. But the Moabites saw what the Israelites had done to the Amorites. Remember, we destroyed the Amorites last week. Or we didn't, they did. You know, it's like football team, right? You're, you didn't win, they did. But anyways, the Amorites, and now, now, so the Moabites are afraid. And so Numbers 22.3 shows us this, that when the people of Moab saw how many Israelites there were, they were terrified. They were terrified. So, so you may have different ways to remember fear. This is the way that I always remember the idea of fear, is this right here, false evidence appearing real. So that, that's what I learned growing up. Uh, this is a way of, of remembering what fear really is, but false evidence appearing real. I want to show you the false evidence appearing real to the Moabites in the next few verses to say why, why what happened happened. Numbers 22, verse 4 and 5, it says this, The king of Moab said to the elders of Midian, Me, the Moabites and Midianites were connected together. And they said this, The mob... Notice that, will devour, mob, devour. He's talking about the Israelites, calling them a mob, saying they'll devour everything in sight, like an ox devours grass in the field. So Balaam, the king of Moab, sent the messengers to call Balaam, son of Beor. And this is what he says to, to Balaam. He says, look, a vast horde of people has arrived from Egypt. They cover the face of the earth and are threatening me. False evidence appearing real. We already know the Moabites were not supposed to be touched, not be messed with. Moses wasn't going to mess with them. But yet the Moabites are afraid. And he's saying that the Israelites are threatening him. 
Fear drove them to the wrong conclusion. Sometimes people in your life come to the wrong conclusion about you because they're afraid of you. They're afraid of what you might become. They're afraid of what you might say. They're afraid of what you might do. Even though you have no intentions of even bothering them, let alone threatening them. It's not fair. I know that's not fair. But it's part of the reality of our life is that sometimes people simply are living in fear and they get the wrong conclusion about you. And they don't even know who you are. I know it's not fair. But look at this. So in the fear, the Moabite king calls for Balaam to curse Moses and the people. I got a lot of stuff to say, but I'm going to just pull back and just say, just because people have the wrong conclusion about you, can I just tell you that God doesn't? He knows who you are. He actually knew you before your mother really knew you because he knitted you in your mother's womb. And he knows you and he loves you even though he knows who you are. So I don't know who that was for, but that ain't nowhere on my notes, but that was for someone online or in person today. Just to know, someone else may have a wrong conclusion about you, but God doesn't. All right? All right, okay. Uh, Keep going to, uh, I think I'm on verse, yeah, verse 4 and 5 says the King, oh no, verse 6, give me verse 6. Please come, and so he called Balaam, and he asked Balaam, Balaam to do this. Please come and curse these people for me, because they are too powerful for me. That perhaps I'll be able to conquer them and drive them from the land. I know that blessings fall on any people you bless, and curses fall on people you curse. So he's t- telling Balaam, Balaam, I know you got the goods to do this. I know you can curse anybody, and curses happen. I know you bless anyone, and they get blessed. And so, he, he, and so it, when we first look at Balaam, it kind of looks like, uh, Balaam is a good guy. Like he's on God's side here. And because this is what he says to the king in a couple of verses. There's a couple of things that happen. He says he can't deliver on what, what the king wants because of Numbers 22, 12. It says God told Balaam, don't go with them. You are not to curse these people for they have been blessed. And then verse 18 of that same, uh, same chapter says, but Balaam responded to Balak's message. Even if Balak were to give me this palace filled with silver and gold, I would be powerless to do anything against the will of the Lord my God. Yeah, I mean, I love the last week, Lord my God. Balaam is putting God, the Lord, Yahweh, as his God. And so you're like, okay, Balaam's, Balaam's a good guy. If you read through the next few chapters, uh, 20 to 24, you, you get the sense like, like Balaam simply like, I can't curse because God wants me to bless. And he's like, like he's a, this good guy. It feels like Balaam's a good guy. Can I tell you Balaam's not a good guy? I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show you how Balaam, though he says, Lord, my God, he's really not. Now, I'm, some of you are going to be disappointed that I'm not going to deal with the donkey. All right? There's an there's a episode in the second half of Numbers 22 about a donkey who he beats, and it actually turns around and talks to him. And all it says is this, that even donkeys can be used by God. So, so anyways, we'll, even donkeys in your life can be used by God. But we'll, we'll move on. Okay, that's all you get from me. Uh, I'm going to dig a little deeper into Balaam. And here's the di- digging deeper part. I'm going to give you three verses to show you that Balaam wasn't a good guy. All right? So first, Joshua 13, 22. It says this, Balaam, son of Beor, who used magic to tell the future. All right? So Joshua is re- retelling this, I, uh, this story about Balaam or talking about him. He used magic. What else did we know? Look what Peter says about Balaam and re- recalling this event. Balaam, son of Beor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong. Doesn't sound like a good guy to me. And look what Jude says in verse 11. It's, we did chapter 1. There's only one chapter. But like Balaam, they deceive people for money. Like, that means Balaam deceived people for money. So, so Balaam, let's, let's look at these things again just real quick. I'll, I'll look at them. So, so Balaam used magic to tell the future. He loved to earn money by doing wrong, and he deceived people for money. That's a good guy. Not, now look at this. Now this will tell you a little bit more story in Deuteronomy 23.5. Moses is retelling this story before they go into the promised land. But the Lord your God refused to listen to Balaam. He turned the intended curse into a blessing. Because the Lord your God loves you. What that says to me is Balaam was ready to curse the Israelites. Not that he's like, oh, sorry, I can't do it. And so it's interesting. There's more to the story than what we just saw. Balaam is not a good guy. 
But if God refused to listen to Balaam and turn the curse into a blessing, why do we even have Numbers 25? We should not have Numbers 25. That should not happen. Let me show you the beginning of what happens in, in 25. Verse 1 and 2. While the Israelites were camped at Achia Grove, some of the men defiled themselves by having sexual relations with local Moabite women. These women invited them to attend sacrifices to their gods, so the Israelites feasted with them and worshipped the gods of Moab. This is, this is how we have, okay, so you're like, how did that happen? Numbers 31 gives us an idea of how that happened. Look at 31.16. These are the very ones, talking about those Moabite women, these are the very ones who followed Balaam's advice and caused the people of Israel to rebel against the Lord at Mount Peor. So here's what you need to know. Balaam knew he couldn't curse them. So he told the Moabites how to seduce them. So here's the big deal. If the enemy can't beat you, he'll try to seduce you. This is the big deal out of this, this journey right here. We are on the edge of God's promises. They're on the edge of the promised land. And the enemy comes, okay, I can't beat them. I can't curse them, but I can seduce them. Satan couldn't beat God's people during the wilderness season, so he tried to seduce them at the edge of it and the edge of God's promises. He'll try to do the same to you in your wilderness season. If he can't succeed uh, during the wilderness season, he'll try to seduce you with an offer that's less than God's best. And usually his, his offer is at the edge or at the end of a season. You're about to walk through. So You've got to give Satan a little credit. He understands the journey of life. He's been around longer than you. And so he understands. He can see the signs to some degree of stuff is happening. I see where they're about to go. I mean, he was no dummy. He knew they were about, they're so close to the Jordan River, about to cross over. He's like, man, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Ah, let's curse him. I'm going to get Balak to get Balaam to curse him. Ah, that didn't work. Okay, I'm going to get Balaam to tell Balak how to seduce them. And that did work. That's why you got to remember, at the edge of God's promises is temptations, compromises. At the edge of God's promises, temptations, compromise. So what did Moses do when compromise entered the camp at the edge of receiving God's promises? Okay, so now compromise comes. They, they were, they've been seduced. They've given in. They had sexual relations with these women. They, they started worshiping, not just feasting, but feasting and worshiping with, with these, these idols of Baal or whoever it was. And look at what Moses says in verse 4 and 5. He says this, the Lord issued the following command to Moses. Seize all the ringleaders and execute them before the Lord in broad daylight. So his fierce anger will turn away from the people of Israel. What you don't know is a plague is happening at the same time. I'll show it to you in just a second. So Moses ordered Israelites, judges, each of you must put to death the men under your authority who have joined in worshiping Baal Peor. It wasn't that they just had sexual relations with Moabite women. They, they, not that they even just ate at the place that was the place of worshiping Baal, they worshiped Baal. They turned from their God. And so you've got to step back from the edge and ledge of compromise. Get rid of the sin that, uh, and temptation that lingers. It's like, it's like this dual thing, if I can get this for you guys to see. Where we're just about to enter into the promises that God has for us. We're at the edge, at the end of a season. We're about to walk into God's promises. We're about to walk into them. We're also got to be careful of, of another edge. And that's the edge and ledge of compromise. And so it's like this double thing. You have to be like not on the edge and ledge of compromise as you're at the edge of God's promises. And I'm telling you, when you're at the edge of God's promises, it's easy to also be at the edge of, of temptations, compromises, because like, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. It's so close. And we can just kind of fall short because we kind of drop our guard because we're so close. So we want to be, as we're at the edge of God's promises, not at the edge of temptations, compromises. So, so, so I hope you can understand that, that, that dual nature of the edge. Because there is a good edge to be at and there's a bad edge to avoid. The good edge is God's promises. We want to walk into his promises. The bad edge is where temptations, compromises are. And so you've got to learn how to kind of balance that, especially at this particular moment. How do we deal with that? <laughs> Believe it or not, the situation doesn't get better after they start doing this. It gets worse. 
Look at verse 6. It says, just then. So this is just, so, so verse 6 is setting up the idea they're, they're going to have to kill the men who have done wrong, who have been seduced into worshiping something other than God and, and giving into relations to, with, with women who were not their wives. And it says, just then, one of the Israelite men brought a Midianite woman into his tent. That's bad enough. But read the next part with me. Right before the eyes of Moses and all the people. Hey, let me just sin right in front of you. Even more so, look when it happens. As everyone was weeping at the entrance of the tabernacle. They're in the midst of God's presence. They're in the midst of of coming clean before God. In the midst of, of trying to do what is right, someone blatantly, openly does wrong right before their eyes. Wow. Blatant, open sin in the camp. I'd like to tell you that that's just a thing from back in Moses' day. But it's not. Blatant, open sin in the camp, in the church, is still alive. And unfortunately, alive and well. In fact, there's a verse that gives us the idea that this doesn't stop until Jesus returns. Revelation 2.14 gives us this hint of this because Jesus is talking to a church saying, but I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. It's, oh, it's still happening. We have to commit to becoming holy, holy. As in completely holy. Not partially holy. In every aspect of our lives, our, our, our emotions, our relations, our finances, our spirit our spiritual walk, uh, our, our uh, relationships, everything. Um, I know I'm missing one of the five that I normally say, but, but I think, anyways, <laughs> every aspect of our life, holy, holy, not partially holy. We will never get past the edge if you aren't striving to become holy, holy. Not saying, I'm not saying if you aren't holy, holy, but if you aren't striving to become holy, holy, looking at your life and say, God, where do I need to work in these things in my life? You're not striving for that. You will never get past the edge of God's promises because you won't get past the edge of temptation's compromises. We want to get into God's promises. We have to get past the compromises. We have to. So the question why do these two sins always seem to pop up? Sexual sin and food sacrifice to idols. Why do they always seem to pop up? I mean, they pop up all throughout the Old Testament, and then they even pop up in the New Testament. In Acts 15, when they're trying to figure out what should the Gentile Christians, the Gentile followers of Jesus, not, you know, what, 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 are, what are the things that we challenge them not to do? What do they stay away from? Two of the three things they're told to stay away from is sexual immorality and food offered to idols. Okay? Then, in 1 Corinthians, Paul makes an, a, a, a very distinct effort to talk to those Gentile followers in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 and through 20, and 1 Corinthians 8, 11, 1 through 13. In both those situations, the top one is about sexual sin. The bottom one is about food sacrificed to idols. Both here were done together in the worship of another god in those days. So in those days... Food sacrificed to idols, eating food offered to idols, and, and sexually uh, being immoral were tied into the same. They weren't like one, one thing. They, they, they were connected together. We then see in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 9 through 10, there's this list. It's a list of, uh, of sins or, 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 or people who won't ent enter the kingdom of God. The top... Let me help you guys with lists just real quick. If you see a list in the Bible, typically what they're try one of the things that you do within in that reading is to see the first one and the last one. And usually a list on purpose has a first and a last in the order that it is. 
If you look at that list in 1 Corinthians 6, the first thing is sexual immorality. The last thing is on cheating because sexual sin cheats people. That's why when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, love is first and self-control is last because love will help control you. And so we need to understand these things about that. Then food offered to idols was putting their confidence in that idol. When you ate food offered to an idol, it was that you put your confidence into that idol to solve your problems. It's like putting human confidence into something or someone other than Jesus. So, can I just first of all say, sex is not bad and food is not bad. And hopefully only married individuals were saying amen regarding to the first one, right? Which that's what I heard was, was I heard married men saying amen. And I don't know if they're referring to food or sex, but, but, <laughs> but I want to help real quick because it feels like sometimes in the church we kind of like, you know, we're so hard on sexual sin that you can get to the point of thinking that somehow sex is not good. No, sex is good. Food is good. I've been fasting some food. I'm looking forward to eating some of the stuff that I've been fasting. Now I've got to be careful not to eat so much, right? Because then they can become bad for you. All right? So the two, first of all, are connected where they both can be bad for you. In a certain context, both can be bad for you. And anyone who has had sexual relations with someone who is not their spouse or had it outside of marriage and then they, they come to know Jesus or they are, know Jesus they, in every situation, they're like, that, that wasn't right. But can I just tell you right now, the thing that you need to strive more than anything when it comes to the sexual side of things, you need to strive for purity more than you strive for virginity. For those of you who have not had sexual relations with someone, I'm not telling you don't think your virginity isn't valuable and important and precious. I was able to give mine to my bride. And that's the idea, is what you, you need to do. But even if you have fallen short of that, of that perspective, purity is what you shoot for. Purity is your goal in the sexual aspect. In the food aspect, I would say purity is a pretty good thing to work for too on food. Right? Is be careful what... I've had the joy now of having not gall stones, but I had gall sludge, whatever. It hurt. And the doctor said to me, I got to eat differently. Then I had my physical this week, and my cholesterol's elevated slightly. So now I have a very, 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 very slow, very small percentage of up to heart disease. She said 3.5% chance of heart disease. Well, I don't want that to get any larger. Can I diminish that? I'm going to have to eat differently. And so I, I'm just trying to tell you these two things are connected. They're, they're more connected than I have time to walk through today. But ultimately, both these things are, bring us to this, these two questions. Who do you love and who do you trust? Who do you love and who do you trust? Because one is showing intimate affection to a person, not your spouse. And the other is showing intimate affection to a God, not your God. Who do you love? Who do you trust? So we get all this idea. I love how one man's actions uh, seduced Israel to sin. Balaam's actions seduced Israel to sin. But another man's actions purified Israel from their sin. Check this out. Wait, I got I to fly. But here we go. Numbers 25, 7 through 9. Look at what Phineas does. I love this. When Phineas, son of Eleazar, grandson of Aaron, the priest saw this, he jumped up and left the assembly. He took a spear. What do you see? He saw the guy with the Mediate woman going to their tent in broad daylight as they're worshiping God, as they're, they're confessing before God. And Phineas is like, uh-uh, not happening. Not on my watch. Nope, that ain't happened on my watch. You, can, you want to sin in broad daylight? Watch me bring God's judgment in, in, in broad daylight. I mean, it's like, dude, wow. Because look at this. He takes a spear, and he rushed after the man into his tent. Phineas thrust the spear all the way through the man's body and into, go ahead, into the woman's, I think it's belly, I got to look here, uh, into the woman's stomach. And when he did that, the plague against Israelites was stopped. Not before 24,000 people had died. The effects of one man's sins and one man's ridding of those sins is just like Adam and Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15 calls them the first and last Adam. 
And look what, what is said of Jesus in 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, or other translations, purify us from all wickedness or unrighteousness. Jesus brings the purity to those areas where we've compromised. The answer at the edge of God's promises when temptations, compromises come is to get rid of what seduces so you can enter God's promises. Who here wants to enter God's promises? Come on. Online. Who do you, do you want to enter God's promises? Then you have to do this. And so what happens here, look at this verse 16 through 18. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Attack the Midianites and destroy them, because they assaulted you with deceit and tricked you into worshiping Baal of Peor. The, the, the Moabites and Midianites would have been fine if they left the Israelites alone, but they messed with God's people. See, when you mess with God's people, you're in trouble. Don't mess with God's people. Come on. Now, we're not supposed to go around killing people. This is not a literal, like, kind of like, you know, when, when it says when, you sin, when your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. That's not a literal, not, not a literal thing. So this isn't like literal. When, when someone has helped seduce you into to sin, you're not to go kill them. That's not how it works. But we are called to get rid of what seduces us. Sometimes that is people. So you don't kill them, but you may need to get rid of them. Because look, Hebrews 12, 1 says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. That's not sin. It's just slowing you down. Especially the sin that so easily trips us up. See how some of that isn't sin. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. So let me ask you, what is seducing you? What is tempting you? What are your temptations? I don't have time to go ahead. James clearly says that we are not, God does not tempt us. We're tempted by our own evil desires. It starts with us. What promises are you at the edge of receiving? So I want to pray with you, and then we're going to have some fun Kingdom Builders offering time. All right? So here's the prayer options, if you will, is this is you. I need to step back from temptations, compromises, and I'm ready to step into God's promises. Who here would simply say, that's me, I'm either or I'm both. I need to step back from temptations. I see hands already. I need to step back from temptations, compromises. I'm ready to step into God's promises. As you step back, you can step in. Come on. God's promises over temptations, compromises. Who would say this? That's me. Come on online, say that's me. Put a hand emoji up. Say, that's me. So many of us, I don't, it doesn't matter if you're both or you're one. God wants to help you right now. He wants to help you. We prayed for you today that you would know what, what temptations are in your way, how you can avoid those temptations, and who can help you along the way. I believe God's giving you some clarity right now. You know those temptations. Let me pray over you right now. God, I thank you for this opportunity we've had today to very, very clearly see that your promises are available for all of us right now. And for many of us, we are literally at the edge of your promises. We've been going through a journey in our lives. We've been going through a journey in our home. We've been going through a journey, journey at work. We're going through all these different wilderness seasons that we've been going through, and we're at the edge of your promises at the same time, temptation is trying to wipe it out. Temptation is trying to take us before, before we cross over. Temptation is trying to take us before we cross over. So help us step back from temptation so we can step into your promises. And everyone that raised their hand, everyone who, who uh, acknowledged it online, I pray, God, that you would help them not just make it, make, make by, just, just get by, but they would, they would thrive. They would thrive in their new season. They would thrive in your promises. They would thrive with victory over temptation. And when temptation comes their way, when sin comes their way, they would be just as zealous as Phineas was to take it out when they see it. And to get rid of those in their life who don't need to be near them, who help bring them towards compromise and not towards your promises. In your name we pray. Everyone said... Amen, amen, amen. All right, before you go, do we, Mark, do we have the, the last two slides? Are we good on the slides again? Or, yeah, okay, so here's the challenge. Look at all areas of your life, find where you are vulnerable to temptations, compromises, and step back. All right? So basically, take this message to heart and not just 
to your head, but take it deeper and make it something that you will look at your compromises or your potential compromises where you're vulnerable and step back. And then those sections, reading Numbers 27, Deuteronomy 31, Joshua 1, all tie into the message next week that Pastor Rachel will be speaking as we get right at the promised land. This is, this is, this is awesome. And then for those of you going to be here for uh, Thanksgiving Sunday, you're going to be in for a treat. It's a message that I have been waiting to preach since the moment I knew I was doing Moses. This is like hello. So if you're in town, it is so worth coming. It's worth the drive to come to this moment. I guarantee you most people don't even know about this moment, but uh, it's going to be a powerful opportunity. Here's the, here's the uh, conversation questions. What compromises are lingering near you and at the edge of God's promises for you? How can you avoid those compromises? What steps do you need to take to avoid them? And who can help you step back from temptations, compromises, and step into God's promises? We need these things in our lives. We need the what, the how, and the who so that we can go into his promises. We want his promises over the compromises. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you for coming to New Life and being part of Miracle Offering Sunday. God bless you as you go. Remember, there is no momentum tonight because of youth convention. So have a great night with your family, and we'll see you all throughout the week. Take care. Online, thanks for being with us and joining us. We'll see you later as well. Take care.